Hello, this is Kerry Schutz from MathWorks, and this is our third video on the topic of transfer function measurements using this cross-spectrum to auto-spectrum computational technique. In this video, what I want to do is uh, tear this model down in a few ways uh, to examine how it works, give you more insights uh, into how and why it works the way it does, uh, and really showcase its strength. So I want to run maybe three or four tests here. One I one test I want to run is, um, is to kind of uh, prove the effectiveness of these three blocks, this cross-spectrum to, uh, to auto-spectrum computation in the middle of our block diagram. I essentially want to remove it and compare what happens with and without it. And the other test I want to run is to uh, compare with and without measurement noise. Um, and I also just want to examine uh, the cross-spectrum computation by itself. And the other thing uh, is also the effect of these uh, this window operation, windowing operation. So a couple techniques, yeah, a couple things we just want to um, you know, essentially uh, pull out, insert back in, and see what happens as a result. And I think it's pretty informative, insightful uh, when it comes to this particular measurement approach. So the first thing I want to do is essentially, it's probably maybe the most important, is just take this out. Okay, we'll put it over there, and then we'll delete. Um, the cross spectrum and auto spectrum computation here. That's easy enough. And just as a baseline, remember we had really good measurements before uh, we removed, or we before we removed the cross spectrum auto spectrum. It was a really tight estimate. This was from essentially the first video on this topic. Okay, uh, and we we're just overlaying here with the theoretical trend line for the magnitude and phase response. So now let's run it without. Uh, those two extra vector product blocks in this complex conjugate operator and see what happens. Same amount of measurement noise in the picture. And as you might expect, uh, the, measurement no the measurement is not as good. And we'll see that, yes, it follows the trend line rather nicely, but again, we see a lot of noise or spikiness around that trend, both in magnitude and phase. Now, one thing um, the uh, determined person might say is, well, couldn't we just do some curve fitting through that smoothing and, you know, we could kind of fix this problem in a post-processing sense. And so unfortunately it's not that quite that simple um, in general, because you won't know, of course, in advance, uh, which portion uh, of that blue waveform, let's get rid of the theory for a second. I'll just unclick the uh, theory from the legend, which portion of that dynamics is due to, dynamics from the device under test, and what part of it is due to measurement noise, which we don't want. So you're gonna possibly be smoothing out an effect of the device under test, which you wanna keep, uh, or perhaps you're smoothing out the measurement noise, which you wanted to get rid of. So there's no way to know. Uh, so in general, smoothing uh, post via post-processing step will not uh, save us in this case. Uh, neither will any amount of spectral averaging over here uh, because we got the measurement noise and the excitation effect lumped into the response. At, on this signal processing path, there is no way to tease apart uh, what was caused by the measurement noise and what was caused, which we want to find out what was caused by the excitation. So again, spectral averaging won't do it. We would need something which is a more of a statistically, ah, st I can't hardly say it, it's a tongue twister, statistically selective filtering operation like the cross spectrum, uh, not a frequency selective uh, filtering operation. Okay, they both, the noises are essentially, over, they're over the same bandwidth. All right, so now that's one of the experiments. What happens, however, if we just say, well, you know, I'm, in, I'm running the simulation, I can just say I can get rid of my measurement noise, you know, uh, or I have very, a low uh, noise system that I'm dealing with on the bench. So I'm just gonna model kind of the limiting uh, use case where there is no noise. So let me, I change, I'll, I'll start it from scratch with zero measurement noise. And we'll look at the resulting magnitude and phase response measurements. And as you'll see, and you probably expected, they are less noisy. However, you still see a, a uh, significant and or observable amount of noise on the measurement both magnitude and phase that has nothing to do with the device under test and everything to do with the measurement uh, scheme itself. So definitely an undesirable uh, outcome. Okay, and we only want to characterize the device under test, not the measurement setup. So um, again, just to reemphasize, 
the cross-spectrum based measurement is better with measurement noise than the ratio of FFTs, you know, FFT of the output over the FFT of the input without any measurement noise. Kind of a surprising finding there. Okay, what else could we look at here? Well, another thing I, I keep emphasizing is really the key sort of strength of this model. Let me stop it here. I will add the measurement noise back in. All right, this is our kind of a baseline configuration. And then I will delete those two lines and go back to what I had at the outset, again, the baseline uh, model use case. And let's just kind of put that over there and connect that up there. Uh, all right, and we'll, we can run this again. Hopefully we'll get the uh, also the baseline results, magnitude on top, phase on bottom. And now the next thing I wanna do, and yeah, so this is, the, this is the golden reference sort of measurement here. Uh, we say, this is good, we're happy. Let's hit stop. Now, what I want to do is examine just this operation on, on bottom in isolation, the cross spectrum. This is really, again, the power operation in the model. Again, any one block is important to be to pay attention to. It's this vector product block here. Uh, if you recall from a previous video, this was a 400 by one vector. This is a 400 by one vector. And then we have a 400 by one output here, cross spectrum and a 400 by one averaged cross-spectrum uh, vector average output here, okay? And general, remember, this is a complex uh, 400 by one vector here, cross-spectrum. Okay, so what I wanna do is say, let's get rid of the uh, auto spectrum. So I'll, what I'll do is I'll say, delete those lines and I'll take the output of the uh, uh, cross-spectrum and just connect it up to my magnitude and phase uh, breakouts and see what happens. So now auto spectrum is effectively gone. Let's run the model again with measurement noise. What happens? All right, let's look at the magnitude on top. It's kind of uh, averaging off the screen, meaning our exponential averaging has not reached steady state. So uh, we're slowly converging since I have a very, very um, kind of slow response time to get a good average on my exponential averaging. And then the bottom is the phase. So, so really, wow, look at this phase. Uh, it's excellent uh, even without the auto spectrum in the picture. So that's good news. And that tells us something. That tells us that the auto spectrum, it's really only there to help us uh, normalize and correct, um, what do you want to call it, uh, the magnitude response measurement. It really has no meaningful impact on the phase response measurement, which is just fine without it. So if you only needed the phase response, you could get rid of, well, that product and that digital filtering operation and that ratio block. Okay, and all you would need would be essentially the bottom path and you know the FFP and windowing on the top path. Okay, so that's interesting finding. If we go, now let's go back to the magnitude response. So it's settled down now, the exponential averaging. Let's go ahead and hit stop and see what happened here. Well, looks like we captured the shape quite accurately. We still get this one kilohertz notch, it's relatively flat otherwise. So we can say, yeah, that's a notch filter. But we've got you know, significant faults here as well. And this kind of goes back to the first video I did where I just use a random source, the same excitation, band limit excitation, drove the same device under test and just looked at the spectrum of the output. We're kind of back there now. Uh, so what we see is we see a noisy measurement uh, you know, all the little noise effects on top of the, the, the basically the trend line of the magnitude response. We see clearly that it's not scaled correctly. It's about 30 dB too large. And, you know, the response should be around zero dB in the pass through portion of the filter. And we see more, uh, you know, it's not over yet. Uh, we see uh, undulation <laughs> and the undulation is due to our anti-aliasing filtering. It has a ripple in the pass band of plus and minus 0.5 dB. So we're getting all of those effects in our magnitude response measurement. And we have kind of a droop. You see it kind of trends down over, uh, th throughout the pass band of our notch filter estimate magnitude response. And that's due to the zero order hold or uh, effect in the system. So now we can see the benefit of the auto spectrum portion. We've seen the benefit of the cross spectrum. Uh, now we see the benefit of the auto spectrum. It's sort of, it it uh, 
it, it improves the, the fact that we're, uh, we got a noisy uh, excitation and we need to measure with respect to that noisy excitation. That'll minimize the effect of all that noise we see uh, in the magnitude response. It will correct for the anti-alias filter uh, ripple because we have one of those on both paths. So they will effectively ratio out on the input. The uh, zero order hold effect is the same on each path. We will effectively ratio that out or normalize it out on the at that computation. Yeah, were it to be in there, it's not right now. Uh, so essentially, uh, all of these faults we're seeing are due to the fact that we are not now normalizing or measuring with respect to the excitation or the reference level. So uh, that was what the auto spectrum was there to save us, and why it was there to save us. All right. Uh, so. And the last thing I'll just mention without running, uh, this will be left, left as an exercise to the student, is that uh, the use of the handing window also adds some marginal benefit here as well. We are using a non-repetitive noisy signal uh, as our excitation. And by non-repetitive, I mean over every FFT analysis frame, it is a different uh, sequence of numbers, a different uh, random sequence of numbers. It's not repetitive. And so as a result of that, we do need the handing window to minimize the effect of spectral leakage. Now, of course, your mileage will vary in terms of its impact on the overall magnitude and phase response estimates. And for maybe a smoother system like this, uh, you won't see significant impact. Uh, but again, it, it, it's a mileage will vary sort of thing with a higher order system, more dynamics. Uh, you, you may see a more impact if you don't use a handing window and you do suffer ill effects of uh, spectral leakage. And that brings us to a final point of uh, there is a chirp excitation, which can help alleviate some of those problems as well. If one sets up this other broadband excitation, this swept sign or chirp excitation, it really mitigates the need for any type of windowing. And in fact, if you were to use a window, it would have a deleterious effect on the measurement. You not only don't need it, you wouldn't want it. Uh, it would be bad. And we may cover the chirp in a separate uh, video on this topic of transfer function measurements, but not here, not today. All right, well, again, I hope that was helpful, informative, and maybe a little enjoyable. Um, I look forward to doing some more videos on uh, signal processing, mixed signal related topics. Okay, until then, signing off.